This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Merry Adventures of Robin Hood by Howard Pyle Chapter 19 The Chase of Robin Hood So Robin Hood and the others left the archery range at Finsbury Fields, and tearing not, set forth straightway upon their homeward journey. It was well for them that they did so, for they had not gone more than three or four miles upon their way, when six of the yeomen of the King's Guard came bustling among the crowd that still lingered, seeking for Robin and his men, to seize upon them and make them prisoners. Truly it was an ill-done thing in the King to break his promise, but it all came about through the Bishop of Hereford's doing, for thus it happened. After the King left the archery ground, he went straightway to his cabinet, and with him went the Bishop of Hereford and Sir Robert Lee. But the King said never a word to these two, but sat gnawing his nether lip, for his heart was galled within him by what had happened. At last the Bishop of Hereford spoke in a low sorrowful voice. "'It is a sad thing, Your Majesty, that this knavish outlaw should be let to escape in this wise, for let him but get back to Sherwood Forest safe and sound, he may snap his fingers at King and King's men.' At these words the King raised his eyes and looked grimly upon the Bishop. "'Sayest thou so?' quoth he. "'Now I will show thee in good time how much thou dost dare, for when forty days are past and gone, I will seize upon this thieving outlaw if I have to tear down all of Sherwood to find him. Thinkest thou that the laws of the King of England are to be so evaded by one poor knave without friends or money?' Then the bishop spoke again in his smooth, soft voice. Forgive my boldness, your majesty, and believe that I have naught but the good of England and your majesty's desirings at heart. But what would it boot, though my gracious lord did root up every tree of Sherwood? Are there not other places for Robin Hood's hiding? Cannock Chase is not far from Sherwood, and the great forest of Arden is not far from Cannock Chase. Besides these are many other woodlands in Nottingham and Derby in Lincoln and York, and amid any of which your majesty might as well think to seize upon Robin Hood as to lay finger upon a rat among the dust and broken things of a garret. Nay, my gracious lord, if he doth once plant foot in the woodland, he is lost to the law for ever. At these words the king tapped his finger-tips upon the table beside him with vexation. What wouldst thou have me do, bishop? quoth he. Thou didst not hear me pledge my word to the queen? Thy talk is as barren as the wind from the bellows upon dead coals. Far be it from me, said the cunning bishop, to point the way to one so clear-sighted as your majesty, but were I the king of England, I should look upon the matter in this wise. I have promised my queen, let us say, that for forty days the cunningest rogue in all England shall have freedom to come and go. But, lo, I find this outlaw in my grasp. Shall I then foolishly cling to a promise so hastily given? Suppose that I had promised to do Her Majesty's bidding, whereupon she bade me to slay myself. Should I then shut mine eyes and run blindly upon my sword? Thus would I argue within myself. Moreover, I would say to myself, a woman knoweth not of the great things appertaining to state government. And likewise, I know a woman is ever prone to take up a fancy, even as she would pluck a daisy from the roadside, and then throw it away when the savour is gone. Therefore, though she hath taken a fancy to this outlaw, it will soon wane away and be forgotten. As for me, I have the greatest villain in all England in my grasp, Shall I, then, open my hand and let him slip betwixt my fingers? Thus, your majesty, would I say to myself, were I the king of England. So the bishop talked, and the king lent his ear to his evil counsel, until after a while he turned to Sir Robert Lee, 
and bade him send six of the yeomen of the guard to take Robin Hood and his three men prisoners. Now Sir Robert Lee was a gentle and noble knight, and he felt grieved to the heart to see the king so break his promise. Nevertheless, he said nothing, for he saw how bitterly the king was set against Robin Hood. But he did not send the yeomen of the guard at once, but went first to the queen, and told her all that had passed, and bade her send word to Robin of his danger. This he did not for the well-being of Robin Hood, but because he would save his lord's honour if he could. Thus it came about that when, after a while, the yeoman of the guard went to the archery field, they found not Robin and the others, and so got no cakes at that fair. The afternoon was already well-nigh gone when Robin Hood, Little John, Will, and Alan set forth upon their homeward way, trudging along merrily through the yellow slanting light, which speedily changed to rosy red as the sun sank low in the heavens. The shadows grew long, and finally merged into the grayness of the mellow twilight. The dusty highway lay all white betwixt the dark hedgerow and along it walked four fellows like four shadows, the pad of their feet sounding loud, and their voices, as they talked, ringing clear upon the silence of the air. The great round moon was floating breathlessly up in the eastern sky when they saw before them the twinkling lights of Barnet Town, some ten or twelve miles from London. Down they walked through the stony streets, and passed the cosy houses with overhanging gables before the doors of which sat the burghers and craftsmen in the mellow moonlight, with their families about them. And so came at last, on the other side of the hamlet, to a little inn all shaded with roses and woodbines. Before this inn Robin Hood stopped, for the spot pleased him well. Quoth he, "'Here we will take up our inn and rest for the night, for we are well away from London town on our king's wrath.' Moreover, if, if I mistake not, we will find sweet faring within. What say ye, lads? In sooth, good master, quoth Little John, thy bidding and my doing ever fit together like cakes and ale. Let us in, I say also. Then up spake Will Scarlet. I am ever ready to do what thou sayest, uncle. Yet I could wish that we were farther upon our way ere we rest for the night. Nevertheless, if thou thinkest best, let us in for the night, say I also. So in they went, and called for the best that the place afforded. Then a right good feast was set before them, with two stout bottles of old sack to wash it down withal. These things were served by as plump and buxom a lass as you could find in all the land, so that little John, who always had an eye for a fair lass, even when meat and drink were by, stuck his arms akimbo and fixed his eyes upon her, winking sweetly whenever he saw her looking toward him. Then you should have seen how the lass twittered with laughter, and how she looked at little John out of the corners of her eyes, a dimple coming in either cheek, for the fellow had always a taking way with the women folk. So the feast passed merrily and never had that inn seen such lusty feeders as these four stout fellows. But at last they were done with their eating, though it seemed as though they never would have ended, and sat loitering over the sack. As they so sat, the landlord came in of a sudden, and said that there was one at the door, a certain young esquire, Richard Partington, of the Queen's household, who wished to see the lad in blue and speak with him without loss of time. So Robin arose quickly, and bidding the landlord not to follow him, left the others gazing at one another and wondering what was about to happen. When Robin came out of the inn, he found young Richard Partington sitting upon his horse in the white moonlight awaiting his coming. "'What news bearest thou, Sir Page?' said Robin. "'I trust that it is not of an ill nature.' "'Why,' said young Partington, "'for the matter of that it is ill enow.' THE KING HATH BEEN BITTERLY STIRRED UP AGAINST THEE BY THAT VILE BISHOP OF HEREFORD. HE SENT TO ARREST THEE AT THE ARCHERY BUTTS AT FINSBURY FIELDS. BUT NOT FINDING THEE THERE, HE HATH GATHERED TOGETHER HIS ARMED MEN FIFTY SCORE AND MORE, 
and is sending them in haste along this very road to Sherwood, either to take thee on the way, or to prevent thy getting back to the woodlands again. He hath given the Bishop of Hereford command over all these men, and thou knowest what thou hast to expect to the Bishop of Hereford, short shrift and a long rope. Two bands of horsemen are already upon the road, not far behind me, so thou hadst best get thee gone from this place straightway, for if thou tarriest longer, thou art like to sleep this night in a cold dungeon. This word the queen hath bidden me bring to thee. Now, Richard Partington, quoth Robin, this is the second time that thou hast saved my life, and if the proper time ever cometh, I will show thee that Robin Hood never forgets these things. As for that Bishop of Hereford, if I ever catch him nigh to Sherwood again, things will be like to go ill with him. Thou mayst tell the good queen that I will leave this place without delay, and will let the landlord think that we are going to St. Albans. But when we are upon the high road again, I will go one way through the country, and will send my men the other, so that if one falleth into the king's hands, the others may haply escape. We will go by devious ways, and so, I hope, will reach Sherwood in safety. And now, Sir Page, I wish thee farewell." "'Farewell, thou bold yeoman,' said Par Partington, "'and mayst thou reach thy hiding in safety.' So each shook the other's hand, and the lad, turning his horse's head, rode back toward London, while Robin entered the inn once more. There he found his yeoman sitting in silence, waiting his coming. Likewise the landlord was there, for he was curious to know what Master Partington had to do with the fellow in blue. "'Up, my merry men,' quoth Robin, "'this is no place for us, for those are after us with whom we will stand but an ill chance, and we fall into their hands, so we will go forward once more, nor will we stop this night till we reach St. Albans.' Hereupon, taking upon out his purse, he paid the landlord his score, and so they left the inn. When they had come to the high road without the town, Robin stopped and told them all that had passed between young Partington and himself, and how that the king's men were after them with hot heels. Then he told them that here they should part company, they three going to the eastward and he to the westward, and so, skirting the high main roads, would come by devious paths to Sherwood. "'So be ye wily,' said Robin Hood and keep well away from the northward roads till ye have gotten well to the eastward. And thou, Will Scarlet, take the lead of the others, for thou hast a cunning turn to thy wits." Then Robin kissed the three upon the cheeks, and they kissed him, and so they parted company. Not long after this a score or more of the king's men came clattering up to the door of the inn at Barnet Town. Here they leaped from their horses, and quickly surrounded the place the leader of the band and four others entering the room where the yeoman had been. But they found that their birds had flown again, and that the king had been balked a second time. "'Methought that they were naughty fellows,' said the host, when he heard whom the men-at-arms sought. "'But I heard that blue-clad knave say that they would go straight forward to St. Albans. So, and ye hurry forward, you may, perchance, catch them on the high road twixt here and there.' For this news the leader of the band thanked mine host right heartily, and calling his men together, mounted and set forth again, galloping forward to St. Albans upon a wild goose chase. After Little John and Will Scarlet and Allan a Dale had left the highway near Garnet, they travelled toward the eastward without stopping as long as their legs could carry them, until they came to Chelmsford in Essex. Thence they turned northward and came through Cambridge and Lincolnshire, to the good town of Gainsborough. Then, striking to the westward and the south, they came at last to the northern borders of Sherwood Forest, without in all that time having met so much as a single band of the king's men. Eight days they journeyed thus, ere they reached the woodlands in safety, but when they got to the Greenwood Glade, they found that Robin had not yet returned for Robin was not as lucky in getting back as his men had been, as you shall presently hear. After having left the great northern road, he turned his face to the westward, and so came past Aylesbury to fair Woodstock in Oxfordshire. 
Then he turned his footsteps northward, travelling for a great distance by way of Warwick Town, till he came to Dudley, in Staffordshire. Seven days it took him to journey thus far, and then he thought he had gotten far enough to the north. So, turning toward the eastward, shunning the main roads, and choosing byways and grassy lanes, he went, by way of Litchfield and Ashby de la Zouch, toward Sherwood, until he came to a place called Stanton. And now Robin's heart began to laugh aloud, for he thought that his danger had gone by, and that his nostrils would soon snuff the spicy air of the woodlands once again. But there is many a slip between the cup and the lip, and this Robin was to find, for thus it was. When the king's men found themselves foiled at St. Albans, and that Robin and his men were not to be found high nor low, they knew not what to do. Presently another band of horsemen came, and another, until all the moonlit streets were full of armed men. Betwixt midnight and dawn another band came to the town, and with them came the Bishop of Hereford. When he heard that Robin Hood had once more slipped out of the trap, he stayed not a minute, but gathering his bands together, he pushed forward to the northward with speed, living orders for all the troops that came to St. Albans to follow after him without tarrying. On the evening of the fourth day he reached Nottingham Town, and there straightway divided his men into bands of six or seven, and sent them all through the countryside, blocking every highway and byway to the eastward, and the southward, and the westward of Sherwood. The sheriff of Nottingham called forth all his men likewise, and joined with the bishop, for he saw that this was the best chance that had ever befallen of paying back his score in full to Robin Hood. Will Scarlet and Little John and Allan Adale had just missed the king's men to the eastward, for the very next day after they had passed the line and entered Sherwood, the roads through which they had travelled were blocked, so that, had they tarried in their journeying, they would surely have fallen into the bishop's hands. But of all this Robin knew not a whit, so he whistled merrily as he trudged along the road beyond Stanton, with his heart as free from care as the yolk of an egg is from cobwebs. At last he came to where a little stream spread across the road in a shallow sheet, tinkling and sparkling as it fretted over its bed of golden gravel. Here Robin stopped, being athirst, and, kneeling down, he made a cup of the palms of his hands, and he began to drink. On either side of the road, for a long distance, stood tangled thickets of bushes and young trees, and it pleased Robin's heart to hear the little birds singing therein, for it made him think of Sherwood, and it seemed as though it had been a lifetime since he had breathed the air of the woodlands. But all of a sudden, as he thus stooped drinking, something hissed past his ear and struck with a splash into the gravel and water beside him. Quick as a wink, Robin sprang to his feet, and at one bound crossed the stream and the roadside, and plunged headlong into the thicket without looking around, for he knew right well that that which had hissed so venomously near beside his ear was a grey goose shaft, and that to tarry so much as a moment meant death. Even as he leaped into the thicket, six more arrows rattled among the branches after him, one of which pierced his doublet, and would have struck deeply into his side, but for the tough coat of steel that he wore. Then up the road came riding some of the king's men at headlong speed. They leaped from their horses and plunged straightway into the thicket after Robin. But Robin knew the ground better than they did, so crawling here, stooping there, and anon, running across some little open, he soon left them far behind, coming out at last upon another road about eight hundred paces distant from the one he had left. Here he stood for a moment, listening to the distant shouts of the seven men as they beat up and down in the thickets, like hounds that had lost the scent of the quarry. Then, buckling his belt more tightly around his waist, he ran fleetly down the road toward the eastward and Sherwood. But Robin had not gone f more than three furlongs in that direction when he came suddenly to the brow of a hill, and saw beneath him another band of the king's men seated in the shade along the roadside in the valley beneath. 
Then he paused not a moment, but, seeing that they had not caught sight of him, he turned and ran back whence he had come, knowing that it was better to run the chance of escaping those fellows that were yet in the thickets than to rush into the arms of those in the valley. So back he ran with all speed, and having gotten safely past the thickets, when the seven men came forth into the open road. They raised a great shout when they saw him, such as the hunter gives when the deer breaks cover, but Robin was then a quarter of a mile and more away from them, coursing over the ground like a greyhound. He never slackened his pace, but ran along mile after mile, till he had come nigh to Mackworth, over beyond the Derwent River, nigh to Derby Town. Here, seeing that he was out of present danger, he slackened in his running, and at last sat him down beneath the hedge, where the grass was the longest and the shade the coolest, there to rest and catch his wind. "'By my soul, Robin,' quoth he to himself, "'that was the narrowest mist that e'er thou hadst in all thy life. I do say most solemnly that the feather of that wicked shaft tickled mine ear as it whizzed past.' This same running hath given me a most craving appetite for victuals and drink. Now I pray St. Dunstan that he send me speedily some meat and beer. It seemed as though St. Dunstan was like to answer his prayer, for along the road came plodding a certain cobbler, one quince of Derby, who had been to take a pair of shoes to a farmer nigh Kirk Langley, and was now coming back home again, with a fair boiled capon in his pouch and a stout pottle of beer by his side, which same the farmer had given him for joy of such a stout pair of shoon. Good Quince was an honest fellow, but his wits were somewhat of the heavy sort, like unbaked dough, so that the only thing that was in his mind was, Three shillings sixpence halfpenny for thy shoon, good Quince! Three shillings sixpence halfpenny for thy shoon! and this travelled round and round inside of his head, without another thought getting into his noddle, as a pea rolls round and round inside an empty quart pot. "'Hello, good friend!' quoth Robin, from beneath the hedge, when the other had gotten nigh enough. "'Whither away so merrily this bright day!' Hearing himself so called upon, the cobbler stopped, and seeing a well-clad stranger in blue, he spoke to him in seemly wise. Give ye good den, fair sir, and I would say that I come from Kirk Langley, where I has sold my shoon, and got three shillings sixpence halfpenny for them, and as sweet money as ever thou sawest, and honestly earned too, I will have thee know. But an I may be so bold, thou pretty fellow, what dost thou there beneath the hedge? Mary, quoth Mary Robin, I sit beneath the hedge here to drop salt on the tails of golden birds, but in sooth, thou art the first chick of any worth I have seen this blessed day. At these words, the cobbler's eyes opened big and wide, and his mouth grew round with wonder, like a knot-hole in a board fence. Slack a day, quoth he, look ye now, I have never seen these same golden birds. And dost thou in sooth find them in these hedges, good fellow? Prithee tell me, are there many of them? I would fain find them mine own self. Ay, truly, quoth Robin, they are as thick here as fresh herring in Cannock Chase. Look ye now, said the cobbler, all drowned in wonder, and dost thou in sooth catch them by dropping salt on their pretty tails? Yea, quoth Robin, but this salt is of an odd kind, let me tell thee for it can only be gotten by boiling down a quart of moonbeams in a wooden platter, and then one hath but a pinch. But tell me now, thou witty man, what hast thou gotten there in that pouch by thy side, and in that pottle? At these words the cobbler looked down at those things of which Mary Robin spoke, for the thoughts of the golden bird had driven them from his mind, and it took him some time to scrape the memory of them back together again. Why, said he at last, in the one is good March beer, and in the other is a fat capon. Truly, Quince the cobbler will have a fine feast this day, and I mistake not. Uh, but tell me, good Quince, said Robin, 
hast thou a mind to sell those things to me? For the hearing of them sounds sweet in mine ears. I, I will give thee these gay clothes of blue that I have upon my body, and ten shillings to boot, for thy clothes, and thy leather apron, and thy beer and thy capon. What sayest thou, bully boy? Nay, thou dost jest with me, said the cobbler, for my clothes are coarse and patch, thine are of fine stuff and very pretty. Never a jest do I speak, quoth Robin. Come, strip thy jacket off, and I will show thee, for I tell thee I like thy clothes well. Moreover, I will be kind to thee, for I will feast straightway upon the good things thou hast with thee, and thou shalt be bidden to the eating. At these words he began slipping off his doublet, and the cobbler, seeing him so in earnest, began pulling off his clothes also, for Robin Hood's garb tickled his eye. So each put on the other fellow's clothes, and Robin gave the honest cobbler ten bright new shillings. Quoth Mary Robin, I have been a many things in my life before, but never have I been an honest cobbler. Come, friend, let us fall to and eat, for something within me cackles aloud for that good fat capon. So both sat down, and began to feast right lustily, so that when they were done the bones of the capon were picked as bare as charity. Then Robin stretched his legs out with a sweet feeling of comfort within him. Quoth he, By the turn of thy voice, good quince, I know that thou hast a fair song or two running loose in thy head like colts in a meadow. I prithee, turn one of them out for me. A song or two I have, quoth the cobbler. Poor things, poor things, but such as they are, thou art welcome to one of them. So moistening his throat with a swallow of beer, he sang, <clears throat> Of all the joys, the best I love, sing hey, my frisking nan -o. and that which most my soul doth move, it is the clicking can -o. All other bliss I'd throw away, sing hey, my frisking nan -o. But this, the stout cobbler, got no farther in his song, for of a sudden six horsemen burst upon them where they sat, and seized roughly upon the honest craftsman hauling him to his feet, and nearly plucking the clothes from him as they did so. Ha! roared the leader of the band, in a great big voice of joy. Have we then caught thee at last, thou blue-clad knave? Now blessed be the name of St. Hubert, for we are fourscore pounds richer this minute than we were before. For the good Bishop of Hereford hath promised that much to the band that shall bring thee to him. Oh, thou cunning rascal! Thou wouldst look so innocent, forsooth! We know thee, thou old fox! But off thou goest with us to have thy brush clipped forthwith! At these words the poor cobbler gazed all around him with his great blue eyes as round as those of a dead fish, while his mouth gaped as though he had swallowed all his words, and so lost his speech. Robin also gaped and stared in a wondering way, just as the cobbler would have done in his place. "'Halack, a daisy me!' quoth he. "'I know not whether I be sitting here or in no man's land. What meaneth all this stir of the pot, my dear good gentleman? Surely this is a sweet, honest fellow!' "'Honest fellow! Sayest thou, clown!' quoth one of the men. Why, I tell thee that this is that same rogue that men call Robin Hood. At this speech the cobbler stared and gaped more than ever, for there was such a threshing of thoughts going on within his poor head that his wits were all befogged with the dust and chaff thereof. Moreover, as he looked at Robin Hood, and saw the yeoman look so like what he knew himself to be, he began to doubt and to think that mayhap he was the great outlaw in real sooth, said he in a slow, wondering voice, Am I in very truth that fellow? Now I had thought, but nay, Quince, thou art mistook, yet am I? Nay, I must indeed be Robin Hood, yet truly I had never thought to pass from an honest craftsman to such a great yeoman. Alas, quoth Robin Hood, look ye there now. See how your ill treatment hath curdled the wits of this poor lad and turned them all sour. 
I myself am Quince, the cobbler of Derby Town. Is it so? said Quince. Then, indeed, I am somebody else, and can be none other than Robin Hood. Take me, fellows, but let me tell you that ye have laid hand upon the stoutest yeoman that ever trod the woodlands. Thou wilt play madman, wilt thou? said the leader of the band. Here, Giles, fetch a cord and bind this knave's hands behind him. I warrant we will bring his wits back to him again when we get him safe before our good bishop at Tutbury Town. Thereupon they tied the cobbler's hands behind him, and led him off with a rope, as the farmer leads off the calf he hath brought from the fair. Robin stood looking after them, and when they were gone, he laughed till the tears rolled down his cheeks, for he knew that no harm would befall the honest fellow, and he pictured to himself the bishop's face when good Quince was brought before him as Robin Hood. Then, turning his steps once more to the eastward, he stepped out, right foot foremost, toward Nottinghamshire and Sherwood Forest. But Robin Hood had gone through more than he wotted of. His journey from London had been hard and long and in a same night he had travelled seven score and more of miles. He thought now to travel on without stopping, until he had come to Sherwood. But ere he had gone half a score of miles he felt his strength giving way beneath him, like a river-bank which the waters have undermined. He sat him down and rested, but he knew within himself he could no, go no farther that day, for his feet felt like lumps of lead so heavy were they with weariness. Once more he arose and went forward, but after travelling a couple of miles he was fain to give the matter up. So, coming to an inn just then, he entered, and calling the landlord, bade him show him to a room, although the sun was only then just sinking in the western sky. There were but three bedrooms in the place and to the meanest of these the landlord showed Robin Hood. But little Robin cared for the looks of the place, for he could have slept that night upon a bed of broken stones. So, stripping off his clothes without more ado, he rolled into the bed and was asleep almost ere his head touched the pillow. Not long after Robin had so gone to his rest, a great cloud peeped blackly over the hills to the westward, Higher and higher it arose until it piled up into the night like a mountain of darkness. All around beneath it came ever and anon a dull red flash, and presently a short grim mutter of the coming thunder was heard. Then up rode four stout burghers of Nottingham Town, for this was the only inn within five miles' distance, and they did not care to be caught in such a thunderstorm as this that was coming upon them. Leaving their nags to the stableman, they entered the best room of the inn, where fresh green rushes lay all spread upon the floor, and there called for the goodliest fare that the place afforded. After having eaten heartily, they bade the landlord show them to their rooms, for they were a-weary, having ridden all the way from Dronfield that day. So off they went, grumbling at having to sleep too in a bed but their troubles on this score, as well as all others, were soon lost in the quietness of sleep. And now came the first gust of wind, rushing past the place, clapping and banging the doors and shutters, smelling of the coming rain, and all wrapped in a cloud of dust and leaves. As though the wind had brought a guest along with it, the door opened of a sudden, and in came a friar of Emmet Priory and one in high degree, as was shown by the softness and sleekness of his robes and the richness of his rosary. He called to the landlord, and bade him first have his mule well fed and bedded in the stable, and then to bring him the very best there was in the house. So presently a savoury stew of tripe and onions, with sweet little fat dumplings, was set before him, likewise a good stout pottle of malmsey and straightway the holy friar fell to with great courage and heartiness, so that in a short time naught was left but a little pool of gravy in the centre of the platter, 
not large enough to keep the life in a starving mouse. In the meantime the storm broke. Another gust of wind went rushing by, and with it fell a few heavy drops of rain, which presently came rattling down in showers, beating against the casements like a little hundred hands. Bright flashes of lightning lit up every raindrop, and with them came cracks of thunder that went away grumbling and bumping, as though St. Swithin were busy rolling great casks of water across rough ground overhead. The women folks screamed, and the merry wags in the tap-room put their arms around their waists to soothe them into quietness. At last the holy friar bade the landlord show him to his room, but when he heard that he was to bed with a cobbler, he was as ill-contented a fellow as you could find in all England. Nevertheless there was nothing for it, and he must sleep there or nowhere. So, taking up his candle, he went off, grumbling like the now distant thunder. When he came to the room where he was to sleep, he held the light over Robin, and looked at him from top to toe. Then he felt better pleased, for instead of a rough, dirty-bearded fellow, he beheld as fresh and clean a lad as one could find in a week of Sundays. So, slipping off his clothes, he also huddled into the bed, where Robin, grunting and grumbling in his sleep, made room for him. Robin was more sound asleep, I wot, than he had been for many a day, else he would never have rested so quietly with one of the friar's sort so close beside him. As for the friar, had he known who Robin Hood was, you may well believe he would almost have soon have slept with an adder as with the man he had for a bedfellow. So the night passed comfortably enough, but at the first dawn of day Robin opened his eyes and turned his head upon the pillow. Then how he gaped, and how he stared, for there beside him lay one all shaven and shorn, so that he knew it must be a fellow in holy orders. He pinched himself sharply, but finding he was awake, sat up in bed, while the other slumbered as peacefully as though he were safe and sound at home in Emmet Priory. Now, quoth Robin to himself, I wonder how this thing hath dropped into my bed during the night. So saying, he arose softly, so as not to waken the other, and looking about the room he espied the friar's clothes lying upon a bench near the wall. First he looked at the clothes, with his head on one side, then he looked at the friar, and slowly winked an eye. Quoth he, Good brother, whate'er thy name may be, as thou hast borrowed my bed so freely, I'll e'en borrow thy clothes in return. So saying, he straightway donned the holy man's garb, but kindly left the cobbler's clothes in the place of it. Then he went forth into the freshness of the morning, and the stableman that was up and about the stables opened his eyes as though he saw a green mouse before him, for such men as the friars of Emmet were not wont to be early risers, but the man bottled his thoughts, and only asked Robin whether he wanted his mule brought from the stable. "'Yea, my son,' quoth Robin, albeit he knew naught of the mule, "'and bring it forth quickly, I prithee, for I am late and must be jogging.' So presently the stableman brought forth the mule, and Robin mounted it, and went on his way rejoicing. As for the holy friar, when he arose he was in as pretty a stew as any man in all the world, for his rich soft robes were gone, likewise his purse with ten golden pounds in it, and naught was left but patched clothes and a leathern apron. He raged and swore like any layman, but as his swearing mended nothing, and the landlord could not aid him, and as, moreover, he was forced to be at Emmet Priory that very morning upon matters of business, he was fain either to don the cobbler's clothes, or travel the road in nakedness. So he put on the clothes, and still raging and swearing vengeance against all the cobblers in Derbyshire, he set forth upon his way afoot. But his ills had not yet done with him, for he had not gone far ere he fell into the hands of the king's men, who marched him off willy-nilly to Tutbury Town and the Bishop of Hereford. 
In vain he swore he was a holy man, and showed his shaven crown. Off he must go, for nothing would do but that he was Robin Hood. Meanwhile, Mary Robin rode along contentedly, passing safely by two bands of the king's men, until his heart began to dance within him because of the nearness of Sherwood. So he travelled ever on to the eastward, till of a sudden he met a noble knight in a shady lane. Then Robin checked his mule quickly, and leaped from off its back. "'Now well met, Sir Richard of the Lee!' cried he. "'For rather than any other man in England would I see thy good face this day!' Then he told Sir Richard all the happenings that had befallen him, and that now at last he felt himself safe, being so nigh to Sherwood again. But when Robert, Robin had done, Sir Richard shook his head sadly. "'Thou art in greater danger now, Robin, than thou hast yet been,' said he. "'For before thee lie bands of the sheriff's men, blocking every road, and letting none pass through the lines without examining them closely. I myself know this, having passed through them but now. Before thee lies the sheriff's men, and behind thee the king's men, and thou canst not hope to pass either way.' for by this time they will know of thy disguise, and will be in waiting to seize upon thee. My castle, and everything within it, are thine, but naught could be gained there, for I could not hope to hold it against such a force as is now in Nottingham of the king's and sheriff's men. Having so spoken, Sir Richard bent his head in thought, and Robin felt his heart sink within him like that of the fox that hears the hounds at his heels and finds his den blocked with earth, so that there is no hiding for him. But presently Sir Richard spoke again, saying, One thing thou canst do, Robin, and one only. Go back to London, and throw thyself upon the mercy of our good Queen Eleanor. Come with me straightway to my castle. Doff these clothes, put on such as my retainers wear. Then I will hie me to London town with a troop of men behind me, and thou shalt mingle with them, and thus will I bring thee to where thou mayest see and speak with the queen. Thy only hope is to get to Sherwood, for there none can reach thee, and thou wilt never get to Sherwood but in this way. So Robin went with Sir Richard of the Lee, and did as he said, for he saw the wisdom of that which the knight advised and that this was his only chance of safety. Queen Eleanor walked in her royal garden, amid the roses that bloomed sweetly, and with her walked six of her ladies-in-waiting, chattering blithely together. Of a sudden a man leaped up to the top of the wall from the other side, and then, hanging for a moment, dropped lightly upon the grass within. All the ladies-in-waiting shrieked at the suddenness of his coming, but the man ran to the queen and kneeled at her feet, and she saw that it was Robin Hood. "'Why, how now, Robin?' cried she. "'Dost thou dare to come into the very jaws of the raging lion? Alas, poor fellow, thou art lost indeed if the king finds thee here. Dost thou not know he is seeking thee through all the land?' "'Yea,' quoth Robin, "'I do know right well that the king seeks me, and therefore I have come, for surely no ill can befall me when he hath pledged his royal word to your majesty for my safety. Moreover, I know your majesty's kindness and gentleness of heart, and so I lay my life freely in your gracious hands. I take thy meaning, Robin Hood, said the queen, and that thou dost convey reproach to me, as well thou mayest for I know that I have not done by thee as I ought to have done. I know right well that thou must have been hard pressed by peril to leap so boldly into one danger to escape another. Once more I promise thee mine aid, and will do all I can to send thee back in safety to Sherwood Forest. Bide thou here till I return. So saying, she left Robin in the garden of roses and was gone a long time. When she came back, Sir Robert Lee was with her, and the Queen's cheeks were hot, and the Queen's eyes were bright, as though she had been talking with high words. Then Sir Robert came straight forward to where Robin Hood stood, 
and he spoke to the yeoman in a cold, stern voice. Quoth he, Our gracious sovereign the king hath mitigated his wrath toward thee, fellow, and hath once more promised that thou shalt depart in peace and safety. Not only hath he promised this, but in three days he will send one of his pages to go with thee, and see that none arrest thy journey back again. Thou mayest thank thy patron saint that thou hast such a good friend in our noble queen, for, but for her persuasion and arguments, thou hadst been a dead man, I can tell thee. Let this peril that thou hast passed through teach thee two lessons. First, be more honest. Second, be not so bold in thy comings and goings. A man that walketh in the darkness as thou dost may escape for a time, but in the end he will surely fall into the pit. Thou hast put thy head in the angry lion's mouth, and yet thou hast escaped by a miracle. Try it not again. So saying, he turned and left Robin, and was gone. For three days Robin abided in London in the Queen's household, and at the end of that time the King's head-page, Edward Cunningham, came, and taking Robin with him, departed northward upon his way to Sherwood. Now and then they passed bands of the King's men, coming back again to London, but none of those bands stopped them, and so at last they reached the sweet leafy woodlands. This is the end of chapter 19.